I guess I'll just call up uh, the writers to come up and join join me uh, on stage, <laughs> as it were. Um, and we'll we'll begin. Well, in the middle. And I'll get some sort of formal introductions, um, and then we'll begin. What I'd like to do is sort of make this uh, a fairly informal discussion. Uh, We'll hear from the writers first, and then uh, and then open it up to the floor. Um, but I'll I'd like to introduce everyone uh, formally, especially for those who uh, weren't here from the, from the beginning. So Natalie Handel, to my right, uh, has lived in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and the Arab world. She's the author of numerous books. Most recently, the critically acclaimed poet in Andalusia and Love and Strange Horses, winner of the Gold Medal Independent Publisher Book Award. Handel is also the editor of the groundbreaking classic, The Poetry of Arab Women, a Contemporary Anthology, winner of the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Book Award, and named one of the top 10 feminist books by The Guardian, and co-editor of the W.W. W. Norton Landmark Anthology, Language for a New Century, Contemporary Poetry from the Middle East, Asia, and Beyond, considered among the 10 greatest international anthologies by the Academy of American Poets. She teaches at Columbia University and writes the literary travel column, The City and the Writer, for Words Without Borders. So, Natalie Handel. <laughs> uh, uh, is Jeff Charlotte, and Jeff Charlotte is the New York Times best-selling author of The Family. His most recent book is Sweet Heaven When I Die. Excerpts from Charlotte's 2010 book, C Street, received the Molly Ivins Prize, the Thomas Jefferson Award, and the Outspoken Award. Charlotte's edited books include Radiant Truths and Believer Beware. He is also co-author with Peter Manso of Killing the Buddha, based on the online literary magazine of the same name they founded together. Charlotte is a contributing editor for Rolling Stone, Harper's and Virginia Quarterly Review. His work has also been featured in the annual Best Music Writing Volume, GQ, New York, Oxford American, and other public publications. He's an associate professor of creative writing at Dartmouth College. So, welcome. And, uh, in our resemblance, to my left, is uh, her essays in journalism have appeared in such publications as the New York Times, Magazine, Tin House. Atlantic and Creative Nonfiction, a Pushkar Prize winner, and the recipient of a Rona Jackson Writers Award. She holds an MFA from the University of Iowa's nonfiction writing program. Before receiving her MFA, she worked as a newspaper reporter for 13 years and was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in feature writing. In the fall, she joins the creative writing faculty at Oregon State University as a visiting assistant professor. Her first book is forthcoming from North. All right. Uh, again, to my left, Chinello Okaranta, uh, born in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Chinello Okaranta is the author of Happiness Like Water, a 2014 O. Henry Prize winner, and a 2014 Lambda Literary Award winner for fiction. She was a finalist for the 2014 New York Public Young Lions Fiction Award and for the 2014 Rolex Mentors and Protégés Arts Initiative. Her stories have appeared in Granta, The New Yorker, and Tin House, among other journals. Welcome. Um, so I guess I just want to start off with uh, the, the, the panel is about literature in a conflicted world, and the role of the writer in, in a conflicted world. And it's certainly uh, something that, uh, that I've always uh, been or long been interested in. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, there are, I would say, two camps of writers, at least two camps of writers. One type of writer who says that writers, the only, uh, the only thing that they have to mind is their art, and kind of they live a mongish existence. They have no real, uh, they have no real, uh, any kind of obligation to uh, the larger world except to create art that is lasting. And then others, uh, some writers that I've always admired, like the American writer Stutz Turkle 
and Grace Paley, who saw who had a, a slight, somewhat more activist role, uh, and felt that the writer should also be politically engaged. So, this is kind of the first uh, thing I want to talk about uh, with, with you all, because uh, I know that you all write about, uh, in many ways, different conflicts, uh, and uh, some of them long past, some of them ongoing, some of them ancient. Uh, uh, Chinello, uh, the war in Biafra, uh, Inara, the Soviet Union, and the effects of the Soviet occupation on Latvia. Uh, Jeff, uh, the American fundam fundamentalism, Cossacks, and many other things. Uh, and Natalie, uh, Palestine. And so uh, I'd like for us all to, to think about our own relation to that and maybe start off by asking Natalie to read a few uh, poems uh, uh, that deal with conflict and So uh, I wasn't going to read. I would just ask, hence the computer. I've never done this, so hopefully I can read um, from the computer. I was in, um, I was in the West Bank the whole summer. So I was there when the Gaza conflict began. Uh, nobody at that time could have predicted <laughs> that we're used to these conflicts over there, but uh, this particular one sort of changed a lot the, um, the spirit of, what, of the people um, in the West Bank, in Gaza, and the Palestinians inside 1948, which would mean that they're inside, they're Israeli citizens. Um, uh, they're Israeli citizens. They, ha they hold Israeli uh, passports. I don't know how much of you, uh, how, how many of you know, how many of you know, uh, you have an idea of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Yes, most of you? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about when I say that. And I think what this did was um, it left a lot of people uh, hopeless. That's one of the, I think, worst places to, to be in, in a conflict. Because it was always sort of a hope that perhaps we can get to some sort of um, space where we could, we could um, at least live as neighbors. I don't know if this is realistic or not. I don't know, you know uh, if uh, people really were serious about this idea. But I, it was in the minds of, of many. Anyways, um, I could say that uh, every day was a very uh, painful experience. And what I've learned about war is that it, it forces you to choose sides, okay? And so once you've chosen sides, it's very difficult to find a space where you can have this dialogue. And so as a writer, if I write a poem about Palestine, can I present this poem and say, I'm not taking sides, I'm not saying, I'm taking the side of humanity. This is the side that I'm taking. But this is my perspective, this is what I've seen. So it's not that I write this and I say, oh, I don't want this to exist, I don't want the state of Israel to exist, or I'm anti-Semitic, or this or that. It's saying, this is my narrative, okay? So I'm going to read you just um, these very, two very short poems um, about Gaza. And of course, the image that was very present was the death of many children. Uh, and then I'm going to read you a poem about identity, but it involves a lot this uh, sort of history that we carry inside of us. The Gazans. I died before I lived. I lived once in a grave. Now I'm told it's not big enough to hold all my deaths. Tiny feet. A mother looks at another, a sea of small bodies burnt or decapitated around them, and asks, how do we mourn this? Talhamiye. So Talhamiya in Arabic means Bethlehemite, which is where I come from. And actually, when you come from Bethlehem, Jerusalem really, uh, now the wall divides them. It's really, it's only seven miles uh, apart. Uh, they've always been sister cities. And growing up, having this Bethlehemite identity, I really was uh, you know, exposed 
to a different identity within the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, one that really where Christian, Muslim, and Jews live. Because as you can imagine, this is Bethlehem in Jerusalem, right? So, Tahami. I heard I'm an Armenian who believes that stars are the pieces of lightning, history left to space. I heard I have Roman blood and my brother is Turkish and Greek. I heard my heart is by the mosque of Omar, by the nativity, beside a talisman and an old man without teeth or keys. I heard my poems turned into stones with Aramaic letters. I heard here invaders push natives aside. Natives hand their names to trees and trees rehearse the verses freedom left. I heard I was a house made of Mediterranean light, except I only heard this in springtime, and spring might not exist here anymore. They took all of our trees. Perhaps Jesus can explain what happened, or perhaps all I need is to remember that I heard, but this I know, I'm a Bethlehemite. The seven quarters of the old city has left me seven keys so I can always enter. Thanks for doing it on short notice, too. Um, so let me continue then with the rest of the panel and see if uh, I can engage you with that, that sort of central question of your role as a writer in that conflicted world. So um, maybe I'll start with you now. Well, I'm a fiction writer. And um, I guess, in general, I think that what what most of us think as political just boils down to the domestic anyway. And so in my writing, I, I write domestic narratives. I write about families and I write about the conflicts that are going on within those families. I also see um, you know, fiction as a less heated way to you know, talk about these grand political issues going on in the world. Um, fiction is, in a sense, a mirror into reality, but it's also a shield from it. And so when we talk about these created characters that are not necessarily you know, us living people, um, I feel like it allows sometimes a conversation to happen um, you know, in a way that flows maybe more, a little bit more than if it were you know, factual people, real life people. Um, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes it does, but so that's how I see my role as a, as a writer. Of course, you know, other genres succeed in doing things that fiction also can't, or sometimes they just share the work. Uh, what's interesting for me, I feel like I'm coming out of a, a sort of my first career as a journalist, you are supposed to be, um, especially in the newspaper tradition, you're supposed to be neutral. You are not supposed to take a side. Um, but of course, that's impossible. Of course, there's always sort of like a personal way in which you're filtering and processing that information. Um, I think for me, the really, um, I, I feel a lot of resonance in what you were saying, you know, because I think a lot does come down to the way in which these things play out um, in, a, in a daily way, in day-to-day -day lives. And I feel like what I'm really interested in doing is trying to document that. I'm really interested in trying to find a way um, to take things from sort of a very abstract and broad sort of uh, view down into the day today. Um, and so I feel like I, my obligation in a way though in, in sort of what I'm trying to do, it, it does have sort of, uh, it, it has, I, I, I want, an, I have an effect in mind, I want. I mean I want people to feel something. I want them to feel and to care. Um, I want them maybe even to rage. Um, I, I want to provoke a response. Yeah. Um, I, I might be the odd person out here and, and uh, writing toward and into conflict pretty consistently. Um, what you left out of my introduction is that Ann Coulter, very mega best-selling, I'm little best selling. She's mega best selling, right wing <laughs> pundit in America. Calls me the stupidest journalist in America, and I'm wow, very proud great. of that. Um, uh, uh, and I think I think what 
You know, a, a writer thing that Anar and I both sort of go back to a lot is a writer named James Agee, who I mentioned, I think, the other day. Uh, and James Agee, in his great book, that is now Praise Famous Men, has attempted to document the condition of very poor farmers in the American South in the 1930s. Um, spoke of trying to capture the cruel radiance of what is. The cruel radiance of what is. Um, and the very word cruel clues you into um, this is not a, a neutral and calm description. It's a description that's informed by um, a recognition of your place. And Mara says we try and, and bring it closer to the flesh and blood. And when you bring it to the flesh and blood and out of the abstract, you're there. So the example maybe I would give is um, my book Sea Street, writing about um, the so-called Kill the Gays Bill in Uganda. And I had written another book about the organization, the American organization that sponsored it. And so I knew them very well. And the author of this bill, which was uh, to provide the death penalty for queer people and um, uh, seven years in prison for what I'm doing right now, talking to you about it. Um, three years in prison if you knew a queer person and failed to report them within 24 hours, regardless of whether they were your, 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 your brother, your son, your daughter. Um, really, the most, they were very proud of the most draconian law, and they were very open that it was a genocidal law. That was the plan. That was the plan. And the author of the bill knew who I was, knew where I came from, and invited me to Uganda to spend some time with him. Right? And there was no sort of sense of like, hey, I'll just be open-minded sort of about this. Um, I'm pretty close-minded about genocide. Um, and when I wrote that, there were some American writers who said, Charlotte, we got you. We know which side you're on. I said, yeah, I, I, I hope you do. I think you do. And I hope you do because there are stories that I think, and this is important, there are stories that go beyond dialogue, that go beyond reconciliation. The man invited me to Uganda so that we could reconcile, so that we could find common ground. I don't want to stand on common ground with genocide. I want to understand him. And you can get very, very close and very intimate. And there are stories like that. I don't think every writer has to tell them. I think it's fine for writers to be just artists. But sometimes in our reverence for art, we forget that place, that there are places where you do need to think about which side you're on. Well, um, let me, uh, about A.G. Um, so A.G., when he wrote Les, Now Praise Famous Men, which I, I, I also love, um, it, probably sold about 200 copies in his lifetime. Uh, and uh, it wasn't reissued until after he died. It was reissued after he won a posthumous Pulitzer Prize. Um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous book. Uh, it was, it, it's a, a kind of messy, crazy, wonderful book uh, that does try to document the lives of migrant uh, uh, cotton farmers uh, in the South, Southern United States. Um, but so I wonder, by the time he f that book became famous, um, the lives of those cotton farmers were, was history. That was history. They, they, they were already, that, that whole lifestyle was dying out. And, and Matthew Arnold said that uh, journalism is literature and it is it, it, it in a hurry. He said that journalism is literature in a hurry. So I wonder if if literature is slowed, is also kind of slowed down uh, literature, uh, journalism. I mean, if there's a way in which uh, that um, a book, even though it, it can't make an impact on um, on the, the moment, it, it, what makes it still worthwhile is, you know, to document something that you can't have an effect on? You can have an effect on, say, Uganda, perhaps, but maybe not. Yeah, you don't write, I don't, I don't think you write to have an effect. But if you go to the Matthew Arnold, it's really wonderful because there's a term <coughs> used sometimes to describe something like the work that, that Nara and Rob and I all do, this sort of this nonfiction hybrid. New journalism was used in the 1960s. And Matthew Arnold actually coins that term almost 100 years before that. And he talks about this prose, and, and particularly in response to a writer named W.T. Stead, who was. Um, documenting the sale of underage girls as sex slaves in England at the time. Um, and was sort of this early sort of documentary artist. And he said, well, this is very, very troublesome. 
this is embarrassing some very important people, it's inappropriate, let's slow it down. And he said, new journalism is filled with vitality and intelligence and wit and reinvention of forms, but it is like the democracy. And he puts the article before it, the democracy. Um, and by that, that was his deepest condemnation. That it was like the democracy. He was not in favor of democracy. Um, and, and I just so that I, I guess sort of when I, I, I use that to sort of undercut Arnold to sort of say that we have to accept that divide and kind of the book slowing and then bubbling and aging, bubbling up in the sixties and no accident then that it, yeah. that, it, that it reappears at that that very contentious moment. What about you, Natalie? Do you feel that um, as a poet um, that you are having a kind of um, what a kind of ripple effect? How are you uh, imagining your uh, especially the poetry that is, say, um, engaged in a kind of political landscape. I, I think I agree with Jeff in that. I mean, there's just a, there's a there's an impulse to sort of uh, uh, write what you're witnessing. I think we write, um, as you said, about what we know essentially and what's sort of uh, the life that is um, beating around us. And the other thing is that I think sometimes we have it. We we try to um, leave a context in which we're from, but we've inherited these contexts. And as far as we try to run, some of us can't. You know, we, we try to run, and then we go back to that space. I know I've tried to run away, and I keep coming back to that space. But the other thing is that um, for me, I mean, I'm very much. Um, you know, Caroline Forche speaks about the poetry of witness, and um, I, my life experience, having lived in you know four continents, having seen conflict not only in the Middle East but um, in, in in Latin America and different parts of the world, it's been very difficult for me to sort of not think about those issues and go back to the what I spoke, um, which is this idea of sides constantly without saying, okay, well, how about the humanity? How do we go back to that? Uh, when it's when we edited the anthology language for a new century, part, the birth of that anthology came when uh, Ravi, Tina, and I, after 9-11, wanted to sort of offer the West another view of what it was to come from the East. And also, what was it to come from the East? You know, what did that mean exactly? And so that conversation for me um, is really important. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> you just made me think of um, what a lot of fiction editors say. I think Alan Bergenis once visited Iowa and said what I thought was exactly right, um, that literature, and he was speaking about fiction, um, that it was sort of like a, like psychology, but like obsessive psychology, where like certain writers spend their entire lives writing about the same things, like different ways of exploring the same exact issues over and over again. So you'll see like novels or short story writers and they're different characters, different settings maybe, but it's the same maybe like father-son relationship being explored from different angles. Like they're working out like this trauma or something that happened to them over and over and over again, just in different forms. And I think that's exactly right. For me, at least, I know that mine has to do a lot. People notice it even before I do. They're like, oh, you write a lot about mothers and daughters. Or just the fact that I'm from Nigeria. And so I have, a, you know, it's almost like an obsession with like, the political issues going on. And I don't think writers have to deal with that. And I think it would be nice to not have to sometimes have on your mind these really issues, but somehow, you know, you become obsessed with them and then you write and you try. For me, my writing is sort of like a way to purge, explore, figure out things, create alternate um, universes where you can fix something, or sometimes, or most times, I don't fix anything. Like my books, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a trick because nothing here is happy, but um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that's just something that you really think about.